Hello, Venerables. Welcome back to second half of Lecture 7. Hope you are all refreshed for this second half now. Now, let us... In the first half of Lecture 7, we've covered the role of faith, a conceptual understanding of morality, then looking at the three components of right speech, right action, right livelihood, and then the practice of morality one precepts, the five precepts, um, the ten causes of unwholesome action and vegetarianism. So now let us go on to finish precepts and move on to family relations and social relations. The practice of morality three, economic welfare and political governance. And then a few words on homework and reflections four. Now, we have talked about five precepts here yeah, for lay people. No killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, intoxicants. And now let us move on to the eight precepts. So we're on page five of lecture seven notes, uh, uh, lecture seven notes now. If you are with us, if not, just listen and then you can review the lecture notes subsequently. Now, the committed lay follower may practice on special occasions for limited periods. Here, the third precept, right? The third precept of the eight precepts of avoiding sexual misconduct is replaced by avoiding all sexual activity. There are another three precepts of avoiding. And these three are eating at an unseasonable time. This means not eating any solid food after noon. Then avoid dancing, singing, music and visiting shows, wearing garlands, perfumes, finery and adornment. So in other words, avoiding entertainment, makeup, perfume, jewelry and exquisite colorful clothes. And then avoid sleeping on high or luxurious beds. Uh, which means to diminish, right? To overcome laziness or feelings of grandeur. So looking at this chart, on the left, we have the five precepts for lay people. In the middle, um, we have the eight precepts for more serious uh, 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 devotees, right? Now we call them yogis. So the first five are the same. Then six, seven, a, seven, b, and, and eight. These are the three additional uh, precepts. So normally when we talk about uh, eight precepts, uh, we can talk about ob observing eight precepts at least for one day or 24 hours. Yeah? In Kuomeng Sam Monastery, for instance, every uh, now and then we have a ceremony for uh, householders, for our devotees to observe eight precepts. They come in the morning, let's say 9 o'clock a.m. and then um, they go through the whole day here. In the evening they go back, but they are asked to observe the eight precepts until the following morning, 9 a.m. Okay. And of course, one can ob also observe eight precepts for a longer time if one wishes. Then let's move on to the 10 precepts. And this is practiced by novice monks. Sramane Rakka, Samane Ra, and novice nuns, Sramane Rikka in Sanskrit and Samaneri in Pali. So here the seventh precept is split into two and there is an additional precept to abstain from accepting gold and silver including money. So at this chart on the right we have seen it for uh, novice monastics, novice monks and nuns. So basically the first five again is the same and then the next four right is actually the same as the eight precepts except that for the seven precepts of the eight precepts it is broken into two right for the novice um, monastics and then the novice monastics have one more precept of avoiding um, gold and silver and money okay so the five precepts the eight precepts and the ten precepts now, if Theravada woman who permanently keeps the eight or ten precepts is known as Dasa Silmata in Sri Lanka or Mechi in Thailand, 
or Donchi in Cambodia, or Mekau in Laos, and Thilashin in Myanmar. So in Theravada Buddhist countries, uh, there are still very few uh, bhikkhuni nuns, right? And uh, most of the devoted females, they maintain eight or ten precepts, and then they are known by these terms. So the picture on the left, that's the Thilashin in Myanmar. Yeah? And then for the other um, Theravada Buddhist countries of Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos, normally they wear white robes. Okay? All right, let's move on then to precepts for monks and monks. Now, for monastics, good conduct is elaborated in terms of, well, there are various codes. For Theravada um, monastics, Theravadin code, right? There are 227 rules for monks and 311 for nuns used in Southern Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism. Well, in this picture here on the left, we see um, Bhikkhu Tanisaro's translation of the Buddhist monastic code, right? volumes 1 and 2. And then there's the Dhammaguptaka code, which consists of 250 rules for monks and 348 for nuns. And they are used in Eastern Buddhism, um, basically referring to China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, right? So this quote, the Dhammaguptaka quote, was translated into Chinese in the 5th century. So on the right picture here, we have a book talking about the origins of Buddhist monastic quotes in China. Then we have another third quote known as the Mula Savastivadin quote. And this consists of 258 rules for monks and 366 for nuns. And they are used in Northern Buddhism, being translated into Tibetan in the 9th century. So here we're talking about the monastic code, Mula Savastivadin uh, code for Tibetan uh, monastics, right? Vashrayana monastics. The practice of good conduct, like faith, is orientated towards meditation practice. The ten causes of unwholesome action cause harm to others, bring unpleasant results upon us, damage our sense of well-being, and result in feelings of guilt and remorse. Keeping the precepts will free our mind from guilt. It has a strong protective quality, warding off danger, and better prepare us for meditation practice, for the stealing and calming of the mind. Okay, so we've talked about faith earlier on. Now, when we talk about uh, morality, good conduct, ethical discipline, uh, they are also important uh, for meditation practice. So if we avoid the unwholesome actions, then we will not have uh, guilty feelings. When we keep the precepts, ah, uh, we will have a strong protective quality. We will have a calm, clear, peaceful mind, and this will prepare us for meditation. Hence, one who abides by the precepts experiences a blameless happiness within. A blameless happiness means the happiness of morality. Such a person feels at ease, at peace, and feels like a king duly crowned and with his enemies subdued. So take a look at this uh, a, a slide here. On the left here, yeah, for somebody who has been doing um, unwholesome things, ah, when he sleeps, he will not have a good sound sleep, right? All kinds of nightmares. On the other hand, for somebody um, who abides by the precepts, yeah, ah, when he sleeps, he will have a very sound sleep and have uh, a wonderful dreams, yeah? Or perhaps of the Buddha um, and other heavenly beings. So he will feel like a king, uh, duly crowned and with no enemies, right? All the enemies all subdued by his um, good conduct, by his morality, by his ethical uh, discipline. So in this context, 
The Dalai Lama tells us that, I believe that the only true religion consists of having a good heart. Okay, a good heart. So this is at the core of um, morality, at the core of good conduct, ethical discipline. To have a good heart, no matter what religion. Hmm? So, so far we've talked all about individual practices of morality, isn't it? Yeah, five precepts, ten precepts, uh, eight precepts, ten precepts, the monastic codes. Now let us move on to the practice of morality in terms of family relations and social relations. Now, within the social unit of the family, members need to fulfill their reciprocal recipro responsibilities if they want harmony and happiness. Yeah, so this is the part about family relations. Similarly, in the society as a whole, all members of the community need to fulfill their responsibilities so that everyone will be able to live in security and peace. Okay, so here the Buddha also offers us uh, teachings on how to uh, cultivate morality and happiness and uh, for families and for the society. And this is found in the Sigalovada Sutta, the discourse to, to Sigala, the layperson's coat of discipline. The Sigalovada Sutta teaches that morality and happiness can be cultivated through the proper observance of six kinds of human relations. Family relations, there are two kinds, and then social relations, there are four kinds. So the two types of family relations are parent and child, husband and wife, and the four types of social relations are teacher, pupil, among friends, employer, employee, religious teacher, and disciple. So in this chart here you see the six different directions, right? Two types of um, family relations, and then four types of social relations. So we live in an interdependent society. We need harmony in each of these relationships. The Singalovada, the Singalovada Sutta tells us. Now one day the Buddha saw this householder by the name of Sigala bowing in the six directions. Well, Sigala promised his father, right, at his deathbed, that he will observe this ritual faithfully. Yeah, because the, the father said that if you do this, yeah, you can honor the gods living in the uh, six directions, north, south, east, west, above and below. And then the gods will be happy and would uh, give us good, good, give you good luck, brought this happiness and prosperity. So the Buddha then reinterpret the six directions into this um, uh, six types of relationships and tell Sigala that if you observe properly these six types of uh, relationships, then you will lead a very good life. You will be very blessed, you will be very protected by the power of the teachings, by the power of uh, morality, of the good, power of the good. Okay? Now, these six relationships are quite similar to Confucius, right? We talk about Conf Confucianism just now, been practiced in uh, China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, similar to the Confucian five relationships. Father, child, ruler, subject, husband, wife, elder brother, younger brother, friend, friend. And according to Confucius, a country would be well governed when all the parties perform their parts all right in these relationships. So let us move on to take a closer look at each of the six uh, relationships. First of all, family relations. Let us begin with parent and child. There is happiness and harmony in the home when parents do their best in bringing up their children taking good care of them and educating them. And when the children appreciate their parents' efforts in providing for their security and well-being, feel your love then and when. Okay, and, that, and at the same time, the children uh, will appreciate their parents' efforts in providing for their security and well-being. Filial love is a form of respect that children have for their parents. So for Parents and child, we're talking about the responsibilities on the part of the parents, what they can do, and on the part of the children, what they can do. Alright, 
So the picture here you see are ah, on the left of happy family, parents and two sons. On the right, the six different directions, right? The six different types of relationships. A practical way for an ideal life. Supplementary reader for national, international and Dharma schools, teachers and parents. The Sikalopada uh, Sutta. So a child may express his gratitude and respect towards his parents by number one, supporting them. Number two, taking upon himself the duties that they have to perform. Number three, protecting the family property. Number four, preserving the family honour. And number five, making offerings in honour of them and dedicating marriage to them after their death. So this is how children can express their um, gratitude, can, can express their respect their, and do their responsibilities, fulfil their responsibilities towards their parents. What about parents? The feeling of parents towards their children should be one of tender compassion. Parents protect their children and wish them well. Parents can guide and help their children by number one, restraining them from unwholesome behaviour. Number two, teaching them moral values. Number three, providing for their education. Number four, helping them to make a good marriage. And number five, by letting them inherit the family well at a proper time. Okay, so of course the Sigalovada Sutta is very useful when you uh, uh, give advice to, to your devotees, right? Well, householders, uh, lay people, how to maintain good family relations and good social relations. So from parent-child, let us move on to husband and wife. Well, marriage is a partnership that allows the husband and wife to share their individual strengths and talents. As husband and wife form the nucleus of the family, a harmonious and successful marriage contributes to the stability and happiness of the family. An ideal marriage can be achieved if a husband shows love and respect for his wife by being courteous to her, number one, by appreciating her, number two, Number three, by being faithful to her. Number four, by sharing authority with her in family matters. And number five, by giving her presents. So this is what a husband should do to, his, to do for his wife, right? In terms of showing love, showing respect, fulfilling his responsibilities. So in return, the wife should reciprocate with love and respect for her husband and assist him, help him by number one, managing the household well. Number two, being hospitable to his friends and relatives. Number three, being faithful to him. Number four, taking care of the wealth of the family. And number five, by being industrious or hardworking in her work. Okay, so um, five responsibilities, each husband towards wife and wife towards husband. Now, let us take a look at what the Dalai Lama has to say on this. The question of world peace, the question of family peace, the question of peace between wife and husband, of peace between um, parents and children, everything is dependent on that feeling of love and warm-heartedness. So here, um, the Dalai Lama is giving us advice on how to maintain peace yeah, in the family between parents and children, husband and wife. So we have family peace. And then also, once we have family peace, in terms of world peace. Okay, and the crucial thing is to have feelings of love and warm-heartedness. And kindness is the key to peace and harmony in family life. So cherish, nurture, love, warm-heartedness, kindness. And then we'll have peace and harmony in family life between parents and children, wife and husband. A loving atmosphere in your home is the foundation for your life. Okay, so again, yeah, the home is very important. If we have a home filled with love, then uh, the children, um, every member of the family, right? The children, the parents, if the grandparents are there, uh, everybody will feel uh, a sense of love yeah a sense of appreciation a sense of gratitude so a loving atmosphere so a buddhist home 
when there's love in the home, the home will always filled with happiness and laughter. But if there's discord, that is that means conflict, the home will be wrecked with sorrows. When discord arises within one's family, one should not blame others, but should examine one's own mind and follow the right path. Okay, so have love in the family, tell your devotees, uh, then they will have happiness, they will have laughter. But if they have quarrels, conflicts, and all kinds of unpleasantness, then uh, there will be all kinds of sorrow for the family. And do not blame others, right? Always examine uh, our, uh, themselves to find examine their mind, their own minds, whether it's wholesome, and then uh, make sure they do the right thing. So we have covered two types of family relations, parent and child, husband and wife. So let us move on then to the four types of social relations, beginning with teacher and pupil. Okay. Now the teacher-pupil relationship is important in society because of the knowledge, moral values, and wisdom that a teacher can impart to his pupil in order to help him develop his potential to the fullest. Uh, so on this picture here, again on the right, Galobada Sutta, and on the left, ah, you have the teacher, right? Um, uh, here presumably uh, uh, somebody uh, who has graduated with a degree, so you wear that kind of, you know, convocation, um, hat and then ah, the other st students studying uh, diligently. So teacher-pupil relationship of course very important right all of us go through these phases of uh, relationship yeah normally in Singapore a child may go for pre-kindergarten for a couple of years then kindergarten for two years then primary school for six years then secondary school for four years then two years of junior college uh, or three years of poly, polytechnic and then um, four years of university education and then if you go on you have another one or two years of masters and then at least another three to four years of PhD for those who are interested in following through the entire education uh, spectrum okay so teacher pupil relationship very important for one's life so what should a pupil, uh, a student do? A pupil or a student should show respect and gratitude to his teacher by number one, rising from his seat to greet his teacher. Number two, attending to his needs in teaching. Number three, being eager to learn from him. Number four, giving him additional help. And number five, listening attentively when he is teaching. All right. And then in return for the the pupil or student respecting the teacher, what should the teacher do? So the teacher should show his affection and concern for the well-being of his pupil by number one, being an example of correct behavior. Number two, seeing that he masters the knowledge and skills taught. Number three, using effective methods of teaching. Number four, introducing his pupils to his own friends and associates. And number five, caring for his welfare and safety all right so again pillar uh, pupil or student relationship very important in today's life because uh, all of us have has to go through so many years of education now if uh, the teacher is not uh, morally upright then uh, there can be lots of uh, problems yes yeah? um, sometimes in the newspapers in singapore you hear of um, misdeeds by some teachers yeah uh, maybe paying too much attention yeah engaging in in sexual improper sexual relations sexual harassment towards uh, students or, or or setting up bad example for students and when they do all these kind of things of course they'll be expelled um, from their profession okay so uh, very important Well, the Dalai Lama tells us that when educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. Uh, sometimes in our educational system, right, uh, too much emphasis is given on, on uh, intellectual pursuits, academic excellence at all costs. Yeah, everybody wants to get A, A plus, A minus, and, and sometimes in this 
very competitive uh, environment, uh, we inculcate the wrong values in, the, in our students. Students become very stressed studying for exams and teachers also become very stressed, right? Because they are judged by their parents and society uh, in terms of um, how well the students perform. Yeah, so in Singapore right, and in many uh, countries too, right? Um, yeah, we have this kind of very competitive educational systems where everything is judged in terms of academic excellence. And so a lot of uh, stress yeah, on the teachers, on the students, on parents, on the principals, on the whole educational system. Yeah? So the Dalai Lama mm, uh, tells us that ah, we must uh, remember that we should not just educate the brains, right? The intellectual capacities of our, our, of our youth, but we must also uh, educate their hearts, meaning inculcate in them good uh, uh, conduct, inculcate in them morality, inculcate in them ethical discipline, so that they will be useful citizens uh, of the family, useful citizens of the community and society, and useful citizens of their countries and of their world. Okay, so don't forget the uh, moral dimension of education. Then let us take a look now at the relationship between friends. Everyone wishes to have friends. The test of true friendship lies in the genuine concern, sympathy and understanding shown by one person towards another at all times and in all circumstances. So again, throughout our whole life, right? Different stages of our life, we have uh, uh, different kinds of friends, yeah? Uh, good friends, not so good friends, yeah, uh, best friends. So in this uh, picture here on the left, you see, ah, good friends care for each other, close friends understand each other, but true friends stay forever beyond worlds, beyond distance, uh, beyond time. So I'm sure each of us, we have our own kinds of friends. Um, well, for me, I'm already 58 years old, and um, yeah, I'm still in touch with some of the friends that I've made in primary school when we were 6 to 12 years old, in secondary schools when uh, we were 12 to 16 years old, in junior colleges when we were 16 to 18 uh, years old, and for us, for me, we had to go through two and a half years of national service. So between the ages of 20, 18 and 21, I, have, I still keep in contact with some of my friends which I um, made have during my national service in the military and then after that um, of course I still maintain keep contact with some friends from the university right and that's when I'm 21 to 25 after that I did my PhD uh, for for five years mm, from 26 to 31 years old in the States and in Japan and I still maintain my uh, contacts with friends over in the US, in Japan, and, and in many other countries too, right? Because at, in this, um, when I did my PhD studies, I get to know friends from other countries as well, okay? So friends, of course, are very important for us throughout our whole life. So a person extends how to be a good friend, right? A person extends his friendship by number one, being generous, number two, being courteous, Number three, being helpful. Number four, by treating the other person well. And number five, being sincere. Okay, so if we can do this, then we will have good friends. And then our friends will also reciprocate, will also um, return the good favor. So there are certain obligations one fulfills towards one's friends. A person reciprocates true friendship by number one protecting the other party when he is callous. Number two, protecting his property when he is neglectful. Number three, offering him refuge when he is in danger. And number four, not deserting him when he is in trouble. And five, by right, respecting other members of his families. So this is the advice given in the Sigalobada Sutta on how friends should relate to one another. Well, the Dalai Lama tells us that true friendship develops on the basis of human affection, not money or power. 
right? In today's materialistic society, of course, many people are obsessed yeah, uh, over money and power, cravings for money and power. Sometimes when they make friends, they're not really uh, uh, interested in true friendship, right? They just make use of friends uh, for their other more ambitious goals of accumulating more money or power. So this is very good advice from the Dalai Lama, right? True friendship develops on the basis of human affection, not money or power. Okay, well, having looked at teacher-pupil relations and relations between friends, let us now take a look at the relationship between employer and employer. Okay, so a boss and his worker. The success of any business depends on a good relationship between the employer and his employees. If the relationship between them is strained because of a lack of concern and understanding on either side or both, they cannot do their best. Okay, so when, when we work in a company, right, again, we're talking about householders in general, when we work in a company, we must uh, maintain good relations between ourself and our bosses, right? Our maybe an immediate boss or higher bosses. So in this way, then the whole company can, mm, can function effectively. So in this picture here, you see on the left, yeah, there's this acronym, T-E-A-M, which means team, right? So team stands for, T stands for together, E stands for we, A stands for achieve, and then M stands for more. So team, together, we achieve more. So the importance of unity, the importance of treating each other well in a company between the boss and his employees. So with this in mind, the employer must look after his staff by number one, assigning them work according to their capabilities, number two, giving them fair salaries, number three, providing them with medical care, number four, letting them enjoy special benefits such as bonus and allowances, and number five, by giving them leave at the proper time for vocation or leave to attend to urgent family matters. So as a boss, this is what a good boss must do, right? In terms of providing welfare and benefits for his staff. Hmm? So normally in a company, um, this kind of matters, staff matters, personal matters are looked after, are managed by the Department of Human Relations. We call it HR, right? HRM, Human Re Relations Management. So in, in our monastery, Gominsa Monastery, we have a Department of Human Relations and the, the, the staff there, right, will formulate all kinds of policies on staff welfare and benefits to make sure that all the staff in Gominsa San uh, Monastery can get along together uh, peacefully, yeah, and work for the good of the monastery. Yeah, this is important because in our in our monastery we have about 200 staff, yeah, very big um, monastery. So that's what the boss should do. So what about the, the staff, the employees? In appreciation of the employer's concern, the employees should reciprocate by number one, being punctual and showing initiati initiative in performing their work. Number two, by seeing their work through to its completion. Number three, by being honest. Number four, by doing their work well. And number five, maintaining the good reputation of the employee year. So the staff, right, and the employee on his part must fulfill his obligations towards his staff so that he can justify earning his salary. Okay? So this is some advice on human relations management. The degree of closeness in these relationships will depend on both the employer and the employee. Um, three mentioned here, mutual reliance. The employee is relying upon the employee to perform her job and in, do in doing so, keep the business running smoothly. So each depend on the other, right? The boss and the staff. Relationship building. The employer and building an employee relationship is one that must develop over time, okay? So not only must the boss and the staff depend or rely on each other, they must build up their relationship for the better. 
boundaries. In employee and employer relationship, boundaries should exist at almost all companies. So particularly for the relationship between boss and subordinate, right? One cannot be too, um, too friendly, right? It's, it's a different kind of relationship from between friends, yeah? because one is uh, superior, one is subordinate. So this kind of distinction, this kind of boundary must work. Otherwise, yeah, there may be all kinds of complications. Okay, and, and this is again very important because sometimes in newspapers, we you know, talk about um, misdeeds on the parts of uh, bosses, yeah, sexual harassments and all kinds of uh, uh, unpleasant matters happening. And this is very bad uh, for the morale of the staff of the company. Okay, so mutual reliance, relationship building, boundaries. This is some advice on human resource management in current in management theory. Now let us then move on to the last relationship, which is that religious teacher and disciple. Now a religious teacher plays an important role in guiding his disciples along the path to ultimate happiness. So of course, for this, we are all very familiar, right? Um, now, now you may be a disciple of your teachers. So what should you do as a disciple? And what should uh, your master as, as your religious teacher or preceptor do? Okay. And in future, when it's time for you to become the religious teacher and, and religious master, what should you do? And what should you expect from your disciples? This is what we're looking at. So the religious teacher, the Buddhist master right, or preceptor, should therefore be honored by deeds, words, and thoughts uh, that express their respect and, and, and regard. They should be welcomed in their disciples' homes and they should be provided by their material uh, needs. So this is what the disciple should do in terms of showing respect, taking care of the religious teacher yeah, through his these words and thoughts, uh, and then through welcoming the religious teacher and then providing him with material needs. So here we're really talking more about householders, right? Um, roles in relation to uh, monastic uh, teachers, okay? So the religious teacher teaching with such affection and regard by his disciples should show his compassion for them by, number one, correcting them when they behave badly. Number two, encouraging them to do good. Number three, being kind towards them. Number four, teaching them the truth. And number five, showing them the way to happiness in the future. Okay, so in return for the respect uh, and honor shown by the disciple to him, the religious teacher, should all this, should do all this thing right to guide his disciples towards um, the correct path of um, bodily action, speech, and mental development. Here, the Dalai Lama says that in the practice of tolerance, one's enemy is the best teacher. So here we're talking about a teachers. Um, every person that we come along. Uh, uh, come across in our life, right, can be our teacher, right? There is always something that we can learn no matter who we come across in our life, whether it's the cleaner yeah, of our classroom or, uh, or the kitchen staff of our monastery or a staff mm, uh, uh, assist, attending, taking care of the, of the Buddhist hall yeah, in our monastery, any person that we come along, yeah, can be our teacher. Even somebody whom we don't like, right? Who, whom we may regard as enemy, uh, can be our teacher because they can teach us a lot of things, especially the practice of tolerance and patience. Okay? So in summary, in pointing out how people should behave, the Buddha has provided us uh, in the Sigalavada Sutta with guidelines that promote respect and responsibility among members of the society. If these guidelines are followed, they will result in a society in which all can enjoy peace, happiness and prosperity. Alright, so we've covered um, 
two kinds of family relations and four kinds of social relations as taught by the Buddha in the Sigalovada Sutta. And there's a chapter of, of this in the uh, book, Buddhism for Beginners, which you will write, uh, which you will read, right? And, and this section of the lecture is basically taken from this chapter of that book, Buddhism for Beginners. Now, let us then move to part eight, which is the practice of morality three in terms of the broader economic welfare and political governance, right? So here we're talking about in terms of country, at the country level, right? Uh, what is good economic welfare? What is good political governance as taught by the Buddha? The Buddha also taught how morality and happiness can be attained through proper economic welfare and political uh, governance. Yeah. So here you see we have the Buddha mm, mm, uh, giving, the Buddha of course gives all kinds of teachings, right? So we can imagine that this teaching is, is a teaching on economic welfare and political uh, governance. Economic welfare, right? The Chakravati Sihanada Sutta clearly states that poverty, being poor, is the cause of immorality and crime such as theft, falsehood, violence and hatred. Kings in ancient times like today's governments try to suppress crime through punishment. However, this method is futile, that means not, not effective. So the Buddha tells us that um, well, if a society, if the people in a country, in the society are all very poor, right? Um, they don't have enough to eat, don't have good, don't have a house to live in, very poor, then it is very likely that that society will have many immoral actions. Eh? The people will engage in theft. Well, they will tell lies. They will have conflicts and violence, and then they will hate, uh, uh, hate, hate others. Uh, yeah. And then kings, right, since ancient times until now, how did they deal with this? Sometimes or often they try to um, rectify this by punishing the people. Yeah, but the Buddha said that this method is not very effective. Okay, so what should the, the leaders of a country do? The Buddha taught that to eradicate crime, the economic condition of the people should be improved. Grain and other facilities for agriculture should be provided for farmers. Capital should be provided for traders and those engaged in business. Adequate wages should be paid to those who are employed. When people are thus provided for with opportunities for earning a sufficient income, they will be contented, will have no fear or anxiety, and consequently, the country will be peaceful and free from crime. Hence, the Buddha considered economic welfare a requisite for morality and happiness. So the Buddha says that as leaders of a country, right, as a king or as leaders of a country, we must make sure that we improve the livelihood of the people, right? We must give the people jobs to do, right? Huh? So if they are farmers, ah, we, we do all the necessary thing to help them to make a, a, a decent living as farmers. Yeah? If they are office workers, if they have their own business, then we must provide them with the correct resources, the correct kind of infrastructure, so that they can um, work well in whatever businesses that they have, in whatever companies that, that they are in. So in this case, the farmers uh, will have resources yeah, to ensure that they can live comfortably every day. And then the office workers, yeah, people who live in the cities or towns, yeah, the non-farmers who also have monthly salaries that allows them to live uh, comfortably. Yeah. So when when they have all these resources, when they have enough uh, money to for their living allowances, for their own uh, living expenses, then they will not commit all kinds of crimes, right? Um, they will not engage in violence, they will not uh, uh, do all kinds of immoral things like telling lies and, and uh, fighting and quarrels and having conflicts with all kinds of people. So leaders should, be, should give attention to economic welfare. And of course, in, this is very true, right? In, in, even in modern times, or particularly in modern times, 
Uh, today, look at the COVID-19 pandemic now. It's sweeping all across the world, right? And then as a result of that, so many jobs have been lost, uh, particularly in the um, tourism industry, in the uh, uh, food and beverage industry. And from this onwards, right, it affects all, all sectors. Yeah? And the governments of every country is trying uh, to do their best to, to create jobs eh, to overcome this, this unemployment problem. Like in Singapore, for instance, the government has been pumping in uh, lots of money right, to try to, to revive the economy. Yeah, it's giving like $100 voucher to every adult um, uh, for, so that they can help to boost up the tourist um, industries, right? to stay in hotels, to visit all the uh, holiday spots, and then uh, airline companies, right, ah, are also very badly uh, affected. So the government is trying their best also to support uh, SIA, right, the National uh, Airlines of Singapore. You know, a lot of pilots have been retrenched or taken off work. Then the cabin crew also. Yeah, so this, this um, in this very terrible times uh, of economic uh, losses, the governments, the leaders of every country should try their best to think of ways how to continue to to ensure that the people of their country can continue um, uh, a decent life in the midst of all this uh, of tragedy, right? All this suffering brought about by the uh, pandemic, and and this seems it seems that this uh, pandemic will not be just a short term affair, but it can stretch over years. Yeah, the the uh, consequences of it and its terrible impact on all sectors of the economy okay so in the modern economic uh, uh, understanding uh, in, the, in the discipline of economics yeah in terms of economic welfare we can talk about having real income we can talk about job satisfaction employment prospects leisure time uh, uh, environment air pollution happiness levels life expectancy healthcare education cost of living, housing. Yeah? So to the extent, to what extent does the government uh, uh, can provide the citizens, yeah, the people, with all these different factors, of, with all these different um, benefits, this is how they can be assessed in terms of providing economic welfare to their people. Okay? So from economic welfare, let us move on to political. Uh, the Buddha was just as clear on politics, war and peace. Buddhism advocates non-violence and peace as its universal message. There's nothing that can be called a just war. Okay. Um, well, of course, the the primary example, the main example in the Buddhist context would be King Ashoka. Huh? So in this picture, we have the world's first Buddhist ruler, Emperor Ashoka, who ruled India from 274 to 232 BCE, before Christian era or before Christ, was the first ruler in human history to ban slavery, the death penalty, animal cr cruelty and deforestation. He even advocated gender equality in education and religious institutions. Okay. Well, you must be uh, very, very familiar already with the story of uh, King Ahsoka. If not, Mr. John Sung will be telling you more in the course on history of Buddhism in India, right? Well, of course, Ahsoka in his younger days were, uh, was very ambitious and wanted to expand and conquer uh, other states, right? To expand his empire. And, and so there were lots of wars, lots of conflicts. And the most, one of the most devastating, if not the most devastating, was the Kalinga War. And at this Kalinga War, there was so much uh, violence, death and atrocities that, that it, it marked a changing point in Asoka, right? From then on, he gave up uh, uh, violence and, and, and tell himself that he must uh, learn from Buddhism how to be a good uh, leader. So he says, I will change. I will no longer be known as the evil Asoka, but as Asoka the angel. And then subsequently, uh, he became a very good uh, Buddhist uh, ruler. And in Buddhism, um, it, 
Buddhism does not advocate any kind of violence and peace, right? There's nothing called a just war. Well, in international relations theory, there is this principle called the just war, right? And then the principle will tell will tell each country, ah, on in what circum in what circumstances can you justify launching a war? And if you do not fulfill these circumstances, then you should not launch a war. Right? But in the Buddhist context, wars should not be launched at all, should not be tolerated. For a country to be happy, it must have a morally good and just government, as seen in the teaching on the Ten Virtues of the King, which in today's context will refer to the leaders of governments. So the Buddha says that if you're a king, if you want to be a good virtuous king, you must observe these 10 qualities. You must have these 10 qualities. So in today's world, right, we, we don't talk so much about kings, but the leaders of our governments, they should have these 10 virtues, these 10 qualities. And the 10 virtues are generosity, morality, self-sacrifice, integrity, kindness, self-control, non-anger, non-violence, forbearance or patience, tolerance, and 10, ruling in harmony with the people, not opposing the will of the people. Okay, so these are the 10 virtues of the king, 10 virtues of the leaders of governments. Well, let's see what Ashoka has to say. All men are my children. What I desire for my own children, and I desire their welfare and happiness both in this world and the next, that I desire for all men. So what I desire for my own children, what I desire, what do I desire? I desire their welfare, their happiness in this world and the next. I desire for all, all, all the people who are my, uh, who lived in my country, right? Not just men, right? Of course, men and women, all who, who, all the citizens of my empire, they are all my children, according to King Ashoka. You do not understand to what extent I desire this. And if some of you do understand, you do not understand the full extent, the full extent of my desire. So uh, Ashoka, in a way, is like a like a bodhisattva, right? Yeah, King Ashoka, practicing all 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 his uh, uh, doing all his best to to shower um, the citizens of his empire with uh, goodness, yeah, with virtues. No society can prosper if it aims at making things easier. Instead, it should aim at making people stronger. Okay, so this is one advice um, given by King Ashoka. Yeah, uh, sometimes, yeah, especially nowadays, right, in, in we talk about populist governments, they, populist governments, right? They try to make the people happy by doing this, by doing that, by giving them this, by giving them that. But actually, it may not be very good for the long-term development of the country, of the people, right? So King Ashoka is saying that you sh we should be doing the right thing to make sure that our people are stronger, more resilient, more able to overcome whatever challenges that come into uh, that they meet rather than just simply giving them things okay and this is very true right in the case of singapore for instance now because of so many job losses among the people the government is is trying to promote the economy by giving the people's livelihood through all kinds of training yeah we're talking about training in in the healthcare where jobs are, are created but training in digital uh areas right because everything is going electronic now going to digital right training in artificial intelligence in engineering because all these are all the kinds of careers um that will be important in the future okay so make the people stronger give them um uh, livelihoods which they can sustain themselves rather than just simply giving them um uh, goodies yeah which is short term rather than long term It is forbidden to decry other sects. The true believer gives honour to whatever in them is worthy of honour. So King Ashoka is also well known for practising uh, tolerance of other religions, allowing all religions in his uh, empire to coexist peacefully, right? He does not for forbid any, he did not forbid any religion or cite any other religions, okay? So even though he practised uh, Buddhist values, he did not discriminate against other religions. And this is very important in today's world, right? The multi-religious world, just within one country, look at Singapore, right? So many 
uh, religions uh, found here, right? And within each religion, so many different schools, right? Just, in, just like Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, so many different uh, schools are practiced here. So we have to respect the government. The country has to respect all religions. Okay? If a country is ruled by leaders endowed with such virtues and, or morals, uh, uh, the citizens will be happy. There can be no peace or happiness as long as leaders thirst after conquering and subjugating their neighbours. The Buddha taught, the victor breeds hatred and the defeated lies down in misery. He who renounces both victory and defeat is happy and peaceful. The only conquest that brings peace and happiness is self-conquest. One may conquer millions in battle, but he who conquers himself is the greatest of So the Buddha teaches us, it is better to conquer ourselves than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is ours. It cannot be taken from us, not by angels or by demons, heaven or hell. In short, Buddhism aims at creating a society where the ringless struggle for power is renounced, where calm and peace prevail away from military and economic welfare, warfare, where the persecution of the innocent is denounced, where hatred is conquered by kindness and evil by goodness, where compassion is the driving force of action, where all are treated with fairness, consideration and love, where life in peace and harmony in a world of material contentment is directed towards the ultimate happiness, the realization of Nibbana. Okay, so these are some brief comments on uh, Buddhism and economics. You will have a course in future on this and some brief comments on economic, um, Buddhism and politics. Again, you will have another course on this uh, in future. Well, the Dalai Lama says the world doesn't belong to leaders. The world belongs to all humanity. Yeah, which means that leaders should govern for all of us, for all humanity and not just for their own interests. World peace must develop from inner peace. Peace is not just mere absence of violence. Peace is, I think, the manifestation of human compassion. So all of us must develop human compassion. When all of us develop human compassion, then we can develop If there is love, there is hope that one may have real families, real brotherhood, real equanimity, real peace. So again, right, the importance of loving kindness, compassion. Then we can have loving families, real brotherhood, community, society, real equanimity, fairness, no discrimination, real peace, yeah, for all. And well, the University of Arizona, this is a seminar on Buddhist ethics in the world crisis, how to have fun while doing the right thing, not to worry, in future you will also have a course on Buddhist ethics. Now let's just move on to part 9, homework and reflections 4, which you should submit by 26th of October. Read Santina's The Tree of Enlightenment, Chapter 5 on Morality. Read Buddhism for Beginners, Chapter 17 and 30 to 33. 17 being the Noble Eightfold Path on Good Conduct. Chapter 30, Becoming a Buddhist. Chapter 31, Good Conduct and Practice. Chapter 32, Family and Society. And Chapter 33, Buddhist Observances. Then, short essay topic, Seeking Refuge in the Triple Gem. Practicing morality and precepts, maintaining good family relations and social relations, visiting temples, participating in devotional and ritual acts, and celebrating Buddhist events are interesting but unimportant aspects in Buddhism. Such practices are not necessary for the realization of Nibbana. Do you agree? Why? Present your arguments by discussing Chapter 5, Morality of the Tree of Enlightenment, and Chapter 17, 30 to 33 of Buddhism for Beginners. And this essay will constitute 10% of your total cost grade. Length of essay, 500 to 700 words. Deadline of submission, 26th of October. Email to me and make sure you do not commit plagiarism. Okay, let's summarize today's lecture. We started off with the role of faith. Then we move on to take a look at the conceptual understanding of morality. Then right speech in terms of the four aspects. The avoidance of lying, backbiting, slander, tail-bearing, divisive speech, harsh speech, and idle, frivolous, vain talk. Then right action, three aspects of right action, the avoidance of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Then right livelihood, five aspects of right livelihood, 
the avoidance of trades in little weapons and arms, animals for slaughter, slavery, poisons and intoxicants, drugs and alcohol. Then the practice of morality one, precepts, the five precepts, 10 causes on uh, wholesome action, vegetarianism, eight precepts, 10 precepts, precepts for monks and nuns. The practice of morality two, family relations and social relations, two kinds of family relations, parent-child, husband-wife, and four types of social relations, teacher-pupil, friends, employer, employee, religious teacher, a disciple. Practice of morality three, economic welfare and political governance, yeah, and ending with the 10 virtues of the king. Generosity, morality, self-sacrifice, integrity, kindness, self-control, non-anger, non-violence, forbearance and ruling in harmony with the people, not opposing the will of the people. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy this lecture and learn much from it. Um, have, a, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Yeah? And we will talk again in week 8. So thank you very much. Uh, bye bye.